Welcome to Philosophy of Value Workshops number three of series eight. The question for today is the enigma of physicalism. Has Daniel Dennett lost his mind? Reading uh, from one of my books, The uh, Pursuit of Value, chapter six, section one. Last week we discussed physicalism as a response to a dualist conception of mind or consciousness. We considered the <coughs> inadequacy of Cartesian dualism as well as some anti-physicalist <coughs> arguments and we saw that Cartesian dualism and physicalism aren't the only two available theories. There is also moderate dualism as well as a lot of other possibilities. Theory of mind has implications for many issues like free will, mind-body relations and the nature of value. Yet in my inquiry consciousness is a general concept and an insight which precedes the idea of value. That is value as a principle of life in the form of an <coughs> affirmation or will to value. Today we will examine the controversial views of Daniel Dennett on consciousness. Dennett is basically a physicalist who believes that any emphasis of consciousness is a mistake. I hold the opposite view that consciousness is crucially important in understanding ourselves. Yet in some ways Dennett's views on consciousness might be thought to have an affinity with my own. For example, he holds that consciousness isn't an all or nothing pro property, that there is an evolution and a graduated spectrum of consciousness, that it is a variable notion based on multiple drafts allowing for several selves, and that self-consciousness has been reified into an object and is subject to unacknowledged error. I agree that consciousness is reified and subject to error, but this is a reason to examine it, not to dismiss it. And above the all features take on different complexion when we learn what Dennett means. He writes, the mind is somehow nothing but a physical phenomenon. In short, the mind is the brain. And like a computer image, consciousness isn't real an illusion with only notional existence. This claim of notional existence affirms the reality of the idea like, like unicorns but not the object itself. The crux of my argument against Dennett is that he has missed the point of more central um, importance of the discussion. This can be seen in one way in his arguments against Cartesian dualism which is really a straw man, and in another way his argument that consciousness only has a notional existence is vacuous. This is because it can be agreed that consciousness is a general or collective concept made up of other states, and like John Searle we can provisionally define co consciousness as all the me mental states that we experience. There is no such thing as pure consciousness implied by Descartes, although Husserl misguidedly uses the term. This criticism of pure consciousness is also made by Heidegger and Derrida, and I argue this point elsewhere with the structure of the divisibility of consciousness. Yet all mental states ag aggregate and influence each other in an integral re relation. Dennett's argument that consciousness only has a notional existence has parallels in other fields. For example, Margaret Thatcher once famously said that society doesn't exist. That is, only people, shopkeepers and candlestick makers exist. But this is a metaphorical statement that emphasises a point of view and the neglect of society or consciousness has real world consequences. But this might not satisfy Dennett 
because he seems to advocate <coughs> a limited, um, eliminative uh, ma materialism, or at least a physical monism, that is either mind does not <coughs> actually exist, or is just an aspect of the physical world. And then it appears to confirm his physical monism with his statement that if consciousness is something over and above the Joycean machine, I have not yet provided a theory of consciousness at all. A Joycean machine is then its term for a non-conscious machine that, that condenses and controls <coughs> operations into a single operating system. The key is that consciousness is held to be no more than a non-conscious machine. Another indication of Dennett's physicalism is his rejection of David Chalmers' hard problem, that is, of explaining how any physical system could give rise to conscious experience at all. Dennett compares the hard problem to the 18th and 19th century co controversy about vitalism. So he strongly implies that consciousness is a fiction of the same order as vitalism. But the scientific American reports that <coughs> Dennett gets annoyed when critics accuse him of saying consciousness doesn't exist. And despite his physicalist stance expressed in his statements above, Dennett never explicitly states that consciousness does not exist. Yet many agree that Dennett's arguments are so co convoluted that he allows himself plausible deniability. And his view is at least that consciousness is unimportant and not worth b bothering about. One example of Dennett's plausible deniability is found in his statement that the self or the soul is really just an abstraction. The comparison of the self with the soul muddies the waters so as to make <coughs> argument impossible. Yet he does claim more clearly that there is no such thing as the self. This claim can be contested, but both more straightforwardly and more strongly. Yet on the strongest interpretation of Dennett as an eliminative materialist, he would not be alone. Robert Ford, for example, holds that we can't define co consciousness because consciousness does not exist. And Richard Rorty defends both eliminative materialism and a disappearance theory of mind. That is, words like pain and love are outdated and should be replaced by descriptions of brain events. But even the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines eliminative <coughs> materialism as the radical claim that some or all of the mental states po posited by common sense do not actually exist. And many leading philosophers are critical of this physicalist or materialist position. Anthony Grayling, for example, states that the fact of consciousness is indisputable, its importance is supreme. Galen Strawson and Ian and Ian <coughs> McGilchrist also implicitly cr criticised Dennett's position, saying that this particular denial is the strangest thing that has ever <coughs> happened in the whole history of human thought, not just the whole history of philosophy. These are general positions, but then it is open to more specific criticisms. For example, as above, he's thought to be evasive and convoluted in his plausible d d deniability. His work is heavily cri criticised, but he doesn't often engage with leading philosophers of mind. He argues against the straw man of Cartesian dualism and mind stuff in freshman's notebooks. He has an underlying bias towards scientific materialism that prevents him from assessing all the evidence. On the last point of scientific materialism, Dennett writes that the fundamentally anti-scientific anti stance of dualism is its most disqualifying feature. But there are at least three questionable implications here. One, 
that dualism is anti-scientific, two, that anti-physicalism must be dualist, and three, that positivist stance is the right approach to understand the mind. These points also indicate Dennett's po positivistic perspective or bias. Then its physicalist view that the mind is equivalent to the brain involves problems explaining certain experiences. He proposes, for instance, that value, purpose and other experiences are produced by the brain. But this presents idiosyncratic sets of events or causal se sequences. For example, when my dog dies, I am sad and there is a corresponding change in my ne neurological activity. But my sadness is caused by my dog dying, not by my ne neurological activity. That explanation wouldn't correctly reflect the causal train of events. That, that is, it was the first do domino, or my dog dying, that caused the last one to fall, that is my sadness. It wasn't the domino in the middle, or my brain state, that caused my sadness. Another problem of Dennett's view, that the mind is <coughs> equivalent to the brain, involves explaining consciousness. That is, some things like life, society and consciousness <coughs> are greater than the sum of their parts. And studying their parts as chemistry, individuals or brain events will never explain the whole. This is because the wholes, as life, society and consciousness, operate on different principles. Different pr principles than chemistry, individuals or brain events. Another problem of Dennett's mind-body <coughs> equivalence arises in his explanation of values and purposes. In Dennett's view, nature is awash with values and purposes which emerge from complexity. This is true, but we can't justify values and purposes because of such origins. They can only be justified by subjective choices derived from the structures, the subjectivity of consciousness. Consideration of more detailed <coughs> arguments can begin with Dennett's critique of Cartesian dualism. One of, my one of my criticisms is that Dennett only focuses on Cartesian dualism, which limits his argument. But we can distinguish other kinds of dualism by looking at two of their features. One, its particular conception of the mind, and two, the character of its relation to, to the world. Descartes defines mind as mind stuff, or thinking substance, with inexplicable <coughs> relations with the world. And on this view, mind is a kind of substance, stuff or matter, as an, as an isolated hom hom homunculus within the, uh, within the skull. But moderate dualism need not define mind or its relation with the world in this way. We can instead define mind phenomenologically with the concept of intentionality. Together with an externalist theory, this enables us to understand mind as a process and relation. That is, mind isn't just a product of the brain, but is also produced by relations with the world. On an externalist view, the external world is as a crucial to its existence as the brain. So intentionality and externalism obviate Cartesian dualism because c consciousness intends towards its objects. Moreover, c consciousness can be di differentiated from matter without, without dualism. Some other p positions noted are not only externalism, but idealism, pluralism and pan-proto-psychism. My criticism is that arguing largely against Cartesian dualism neglects, neglects these other options. Yet one of Dennett's main arguments against Cartesian dualism is that of the Cartesian theatre. 
in a Cartesian theatre, mm. images are supposedly projected onto some sort of screen within the mind. In this, there is thought to be a middleman or a <coughs> homunculus viewed or acting on events. Then it argues these ideas are false and hence dualism is false. I agree with Dennett. I agree with his rejection of one, Cartesian dualism, two, a Cartesian th theatre, and three, a, homo a, a um, homunculus. But disagree with his conclusions because consciousness need not appeal to these things. For instance, affect states of consciousness, like pleasure or pain, aren't co cognitive or, and need no th theatre. And cognitive states can be explained with externalist perceptions and internal abstractions. Moreover, a Cartesian th theatre as a, as a screen, either inside or outside the mind, is unrealistic. It presents another dualism between mind and world that becomes a hard distinction. There is a real debate here between realist and nominalist mm. epistemology. But the nominalist position might be better described as involving an interface. But then it rejects the existence of qualia, which might deflect cr criticisms of his neglect of affect states. Qualia are the qualitative aspects of perceptions or instances of subjective conscious experience. Qualia are what it is like to be something, to be in pain or have a perception of colour. Then it, uh, then it argues that many conscious experiences seem to have qualia, but on examination they don't. He argues from inverted spectra, blind sight and other experiences that qualia aren't what they seem. He dismisses qualia on the grounds of depending upon an axiomatic self, which is an illusion. Dennett regards them as incoherent because they are supposed to be in incorrigible, ineffable, private and directly accessible, which are incompatible characteristics. Not surprisingly, I don't accept Dennett's uh, arguments for rejecting qualia, which are <coughs> immediate experiences. The term qualia was introduced into philosophy in 1921, sorry, 1929, by C.I. Lewis in discussing sense data theory. And qualia and sense data are mm. established, d difficult to challenge um, aspects of empirical philosophy. Firstly, I don't, ex I don't accept Dennett's ca characterization of, of incorrigibility and um, ineffability. So I also don't accept their, incom their incompatibility, or even that they have to be compatible. Many mental states are, for example, subject to indescribability to some extent without incoherence. So secondly, Qualia's dependence on an axiomatic self is highly qu questionable, as is the concept of an axiomatic self. As we, as we will see shortly, then it questions the existence of an axiomatic self, but so do I. The divisibility of consciousness presents an amalgam of different states, but this doesn't mean there is no self. I exist in one space, focused by my brain and body, on one perceptible time timeline. I don't have perceptions here and feelings over there. They are all experienced by the same conscious being, myself. And thirdly, the argument that qualia are not what they seem to be mis 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 misrepresents their phenomenological ca character. That is, we can argue that some aspects of mental states can only be what they seem to be. That is, much pheno phenomenology is concerned with what appears or seems to be, but without having <coughs> underlying sub substrata. For example, affect states are constituted by their experience of what they seem to be, whereas c cognitive states are constituted by their intentional objects. 
Then its section on a visit to the phenomenological garden is all about this kind of supposed error. He argues that mental contents aren't what they seem to be, and he de depreciates the experience of, mean of seeming. This follows from his and our critique of the Cartesian belief in the transparency of mental content. But it, it is mm, agreed that we could be mistaken about the character of our own mental contents. But there are different types of mental content, cognitive, non-cognitive, unconscious, and pre-conscious. And as noted, some mental states like affect and qualia are constituted by their experience. So Dennett's dismissal of consciousness based on an opposition to these experiences appears invalid. Moreover, phenomenology is a school of philosophy founded on descriptions of appearances. Then its position is, is confronted by the problem then of having to dismiss phenomenology. That is, phenomenology is a study of mind in terms of what appears or seems to exist. Then it also criticizes the idea of consciousness with the notions of memes and multiple draft theory. A meme is broadly culturally tr transmitted idea passed on by imitation or social learning. Then it describes memes as having both a genetic aspect and an aspect c communicated by human mind. Then it explains that memes are complex and powerful ways of transmitting ideas. And, he, and, <coughs> and his point is that consciousness is itself a huge complex of memes. The mind, but the mind isn't well suited to understanding and transmitting ideas about consciousness. And that consciousness itself is just a meme with only a notion of existence. But against Dennett, because consciousness transmits memes, doesn't mean that it is only a meme. Memes are an aspect of cognitive frameworks that are frequently presented as essential to consciousness. But then it takes memes, or seemingly co cognition, as consciousness only having notional existence. Then its multiple draft theory is that there's not one unified stream of consciousness, but numerous versions. In his view, this would argue against a unified and coherent conception of, of consciousness. But multiple draft theory implies a cognitivist idea of consciousness that we need not accept. And I, and I have just broadened what the idea of an axiomatic or multiple self might, might mean. That is, it's eminently p possible to argue, as I do, for a divided and fragmented conception of consciousness. That is, consciousness is divided into individuals, into split brains, by schizophrenia, and by epistemic contrast. So even the radical d divisibility of c consciousness need not negate its substantive existence. Yet unlike D Descartes, D Dennett r recognizes that animals are both conscious and have significant experiences. But against Dennett, <coughs> animal and infant co consciousness can't be explained by MEMS and multiple draft theory. When the critic Daniel Hutto poses this problem, Dennett is, Dennett is <coughs> evasive about answering it. And he responds that folksy <coughs> intuitions about animal and infant, co infant consciousnesses aren't sacrosanct. But this, hardly, but this answer is hardly mm, adequate to an apparent co contradiction in Dennett's thinking. And when Roger Fellows and Anthony O'Hare repeat the same problem, D Dennett replies that, mm, I agree, they seem to be conscious, but are they? This question has no clear pre-theoretical pre m meaning. Dennett appears to be rejecting the pre-theoretical experience of consciousness that is the premise 
obviously chloride. He also does this by <coughs> eliminating what he calls the magical Cartesian transactions between brain and mind. Yet the magical is also a mantra for Dennett's attempt to, <coughs> to um, eliminate intuitive understanding. Kyoto agrees that Dennett feels that we can't make sense of our intuitions about conscious experience, so Dennett's rejection of conscious experience thereby founders on the rock of common sense. We are left with numerous problems of Dennett's explanation of consciousness. The first problem is a convoluted and verbose style which allows him plausible deniability. For example, he states that the mind is somehow nothing but a physical phenomenon. He goes on to use this evasive word somehow 80 times in this work. I agree that with him that consciousness somehow does not exist, but somehow it does exist. But then it needs to explain how it does exist, as, as well as how it does not exist, which he fails to do. And his explanation of notional existence doesn't explain its phenomenal character. I wonder whether Dennett's <coughs> analysis is ambiguous and obscure because of his scientific perspective. That is, a first hand or interior access will, may well be needed to understand co consciousness. And that such understanding may be difficult to attain <coughs> academically or scientifically. Such may require <coughs> meditative or active experiences in the world. In this, we can again draw attention to Dennett's underlying perspective or bias of scientific materialism. He states the fundamentally anti-scientific stance of dualism is its most qualifying feature. He accepts that science does not answer all good questions, but his de definition of the real is that of scientific materialism. For Dennett, consciousness is no more real than the screen on your laptop or your phone. But this seems to be an extremely idiosyncratic view of what real means. Consciousness, mm. undeniably, has a much deeper content than the screen on your laptop or your phone. I'm also d disappointed by Dennett's account of how the mind m misunderstands itself. I'm very interested in developing my own theory of consciousness. This could involve a dearth of appropriate language and concept to describe mind, as well as the fact that the machinery of mind would obscure consciousness's view of the world. Then it nevertheless provides us with a compendium of information about the evolution and working of the brain. He also explains how we can be de deceived about our, our own perception of consciousness. He cites illusions like perceptual filling in and the belief that consciousness has to accompany behaviour. These arguments will undercut in inferences about the mind made by tr traditional dualists, but they don't seem to result in a physicalist theory of mind or in a complete undermining of phenomenal experience. Then it also rightly tells us that the brain doesn't have to understand how the brain works. And he says that consciousness is the brain's user mm. illusion of itself. But MEMS, mm. multiple drafts, qualia and, and, and mistaken experiences don't seem to explain this illusion. There is a very real problem of the self-observation of mind, consciousness and self-consciousness but I would rather explain this problem in terms of consciousness itself, that is, in terms of graduation, <coughs> regression, immersion, and the singular re reference available, available, to, available to consciousness. I will be discussing these features in forthcoming workshops. And lastly, Dennett focuses his criticisms on not just dualism, 
but Cartesian dualism with its redundant problems. That is, our choice isn't between physicalism and Cartesian dualism with its Cartesian theatre, but between physicalism and other theories of mind, as well as other kinds of dualism. That is, other theories of dualism and anti-physicalism like pluralism and externalism. We will have a look at some of these theories next week. Yet, <coughs> yet today I've had to justify why we should examine Dennett's views. That's because I find that Dennett not, not only fails to explain co consciousness, but is also m misleading. And given that his views seem to be lacking in perception and insight on certain points, I wonder about his reasons for writing. Does he just want to be provocative? Is he just writing for the general public? Or does he just want to sell books? Yet one of my reasons for discussing that Dennett is to show a widespread neglect of consciousness, as well as to highlight mistakes that we shouldn't make. So let me have your comments or criticisms at the meeting or on websites like Zoom or meetup.com. <coughs>